you have your Bible this morning, turn with me to Psalm 119, and I want us to read together the first section. It's the first eight verses. And Psalm 119 is a series of stanzas, a poem that's been organized as an acrostic, and uh, the acrostic is along the lines of the Hebrew alphabet. In fact, in your translation, you probably have a heading every eight verses that is one of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. The first of those letters is the letter Aleph. And so what that means is that the writer has organized this psalm in such a way uh, that every section is eight verses and every verse within the section begins with a word that begins with the letter of that section. So in Psalm 119, verses 1 through 8, all those verses begin with a word that begins with the letter Aleph. Every one of these stanzas has eight verses in it, and probably the reason for that is to underscore that the psalmist uses eight different words throughout this psalm to talk about the law of God, the word of the Lord. And what Psalm 119 is, is a call to us both to understand the importance of living by the book, the word of the Lord, the law of God, to recognize the importance of God's work in us as he responds to our fidelity to his word and to cultivate in us a dependence upon the God of the law even as we devote ourselves to the law of God. And what I want you to see in Psalm 119 verses 1 through 8 is really the heading place of this entire psalm. It's a place where we talk about the way of blessing. And sometimes in our lives, when we think about blessing, we think about uh, those things that we can amass or achieve. Uh, When we think of blessing, we think of uh, climbing the next step in our career. When we think of blessing, we think about getting that prized vehicle that we've longed for. Uh, this just this week, I was just for kicks taking a look at uh, the Lincoln site because I love a Lincoln, right? You know, just it's never going to happen, but I love a Lincoln. You've got a car you love, I'm sure. And I love a Lincoln, and I really love that new Lincoln Continental that they came out with just a few years ago. And I just thought, I'm just going to check it out again because I love it. I love every color they make it in. And then I saw something. I said, they don't make it anymore. They stopped in 2020 when the world stopped, right? And I thought, oh, my goodness, I'm going to miss my dream to get that car. I mean, it was a dream only. It wasn't going to happen, but... There you are. We, we think about blessing in terms of the things we can amass and the things we can achieve, but the psalmist calls us to understand blessing in a different way. To understand that blessing is the reorientation of our person around the kingdom of God so that we prioritize the values of the kingdom of God and so that we utilize our resources to advance the kingdom of God. Some theologians believe that Psalm 119 in an original arrangement of the Psalms was actually the 150th Psalm, that it was the last Psalm. And that could very well be true if we understood that at the beginning and the ending of all of the Psalms was an emphasis on the way of blessing. We read from the first Psalm, from Psalm 1 this morning, and heard the psalmist tell us that blessed is the man who walks not in the way of sinners nor stands in the sits in the seat of sinners or stands in the way of the scoffers his delight is in the law of the lord he meditates on it day and night and here we come to psalm 119 what could have been at the time the the closing psalm to again call our minds to the way of blessing Blessing that is not about achievement and blessing that is not about amassing wealth, but blessing that is about a reorientation of our lives so that we prioritize the values of the kingdom of God and pursue the advancement of the kingdom of God. I want you this morning to walk with me through Psalm 119, 1 through 8. 
and to ask yourself this, am I walking on the way of blessing? And if not, there's an invitation today to pursue continually the God of the law so that you might live according to the law of God and find his blessing in your life. If you're able and willing to stand, would you stand in honor of the public reading of God's Word from Psalm 119, verses 1 through 8. And this is what the Word of the Lord says. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep His testimonies, who seek Him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong but walk in His ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. Father, some of us are here today and everything's okay in our lives. In fact, we're doing fairly well. But there are some of us who've come to a place of brokenness or anxiety or desperation. We feel the walls of the world closing in around us. And we wonder, how can we go on? We find ourselves like the psalmist saying, God, don't utterly forsake me. Don't leave me out here in this mess. Oh God, I pray that whether we've come here on the mountain or are down in the valley, I pray we would all walk on the way of blessing so that, God, we might know your presence and one day find freedom from all the ills of this world. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. One of the things we talk about in our family a lot is foundational truth. Uh, that there are some things that really matter in life. Some things that are important for us to build our lives upon. See, the reality is that every one of us at some point is going to come to a crisis. There's going to be an event or a series of events in our lives that rocks us to our core. There's going to be the loss of a job. There's going to be the, the death of a loved one. There's going to be the long endurance of a medical crisis. There's going to be the rift in a relationship. Uh, there's going to be financial downturn. Every one of us at some point in our lives is likely to come into a point of crisis when we're not sure how we can carry on. And when we come to that point of crisis, we will find ourselves looking for solid ground, trying to find something that we can stand upon, something that will hold us up in the day of trouble. And it is in that crisis, it's in those difficult places in our lives that we find out what we have been building our lives upon. See, you may not have written truths in your life. You may not have ever thought about this and said, I, I need to build my life upon some things that really matter. Maybe you've never articulated those things, but every one of us, whether we know it or not, is building our lives upon some foundational truths. Every one of us has has some things that we really believe in and in the day of trouble and testing when we come to a difficult place in our life we will find out if those things were truly worth building upon. You remember the story that Jesus told about the house that was built upon the sand and when the rains came and the winds blew the house crumbled. 
But you remember that Jesus said that they built the house on the rock. The wise man did. And, and when the rain came and the wind blew, the house stood. And so Jesus was illustrating for us that we ought to build our lives upon the rock. We ought to have a firm foundation. There ought to be some real pillars of truth underneath us so that though all the world may hone in and crash down around us, so that all of the trouble of this life may be aiming toward us, so that we might endure all of the failure and folly of a broken world, we would not crumble because we're built upon the rock, a firm foundation. In our family growing up, we joked about our family values. My father, who's with the Lord, used to say, in our house we believe in Jesus Christ, Coca-Cola, Alabama, and Golden Flake. If I heard it once, I heard it a thousand times. So much so, we got Daddy a sign one year that said, I raised my boys right, Jesus Christ, Alabama, Coca-Cola, Golden Flake. But you and I know, Alabama, Coca-Cola, and Golden Flake, they'll fail you every time. In fact, they're not even in the same category. But that chief foundation, building our lives upon faith in Christ, is fundamental to everything else. When the psalmist talks about the way of blessing, he's instructing us in the principle of blessing, how, how to formulate a foundational truth worth building your life on. And then he's going to show us the purpose and the path for living that out in your life. And ultimately what we walk away with from Psalm 119, 1 through 8, is a new way to build our lives. That if we've never thought about it before, if we've never given consideration to those things that are true, here is an invitation for us to stop and to recognize what really matters and what could be at the core of a life that flourishes and is fruitful to the glory of God. And the rest of Psalm 119 will flow out of this. It will not simply be a repetition, but it will be an application of this fundamental truth that we are called to walk in the way of blessing. So what I want you to understand more than anything else today is this. That we experience the blessing of God as we come to rest secure in the place that we have in His kingdom, as we realize the maturity of the values of His kingdom, and as we redeem our resources to advance His kingdom. Because those who continually pursue a relationship with God, and those who continually practice the law of God, will continually produce the fruit of faithfulness. That those who continually pursue the, the God of the law and those who continually practice the law of God will continually produce the fruit of faithfulness in their lives. So the first thing that the psalmist does in verses 1 through 3 is to teach us the principle of blessing. He says in Psalm 119 in verses 1 through 3, Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. And blessed are those who keep His testimonies, who seek Him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in His ways. One of the things that you might have noticed when we read through Psalm 119, verses 1 through 8, is that the person changes as the psalm goes on. The, the voice, the, the, the recognition of who is speaking. In verses 1 through 3, we're in the third person. We're, we're talking about everyone out there. Those who walk in the way of blessing experience the blessing of the Lord. 
In verses 4 through 6, we're, we're talking about this, this connection that, that God has to us. It's in the second person. You, Lord, are longing for us to walk in this way. And then in verses 7 and 8, it's personal. It's in the first person. I, I will walk in this way. That teaches us something about how to apply this psalm to our lives. And it shows us that when we begin in verses 1 through 3, we're talking about mankind generally. And so what is at work here is the principle of blessing. What's the principle that everyone can nail down in their lives? What's something that applies to all people at all times and places? Uh, we could take Psalm 119 verses 1 through 3 and, and we could just cast a blanket statement for all Christian people everywhere, no matter where they live or what time period they live in. This is true for everyone. It's the principle of blessing. The psalmist shows us in Psalm 119, verses 1 through 3, that there is a way of blessing. He says, blessed are those whose way is blameless. So the first thing that he does is say this, that the favor of God poured out in the fruitfulness of faith, that's what blessing is, comes to those whose way is blameless. Those who who are righteous in the eyes of God. They, they have a right standing with the Lord. They're not pursuing themselves. They're not walking in their own way. They're not going after their own agenda. Instead, they, they are walking in the way of the Lord. He says that they walk in the law of the Lord. That there's a path cut out for them. And sometimes we, we see the... Word of God, and, and we wonder, how, how do I bring this to bear on my life? How do I have a Christian walk? Maybe, maybe we've heard people that are close to the Lord talk about a Christian walk, and we, we really have just begun following Christ, or maybe we even haven't even begun following Christ yet. And so we wonder, what, what is that about? What do you mean you're walking with Jesus? Jesus isn't here in the flesh. How do you walk with Him? How do you build a life of faith in Him? What does it mean to pursue Him? Well, well really simply, brothers and sisters, it's all about about having a relationship where we continually pursue the God of the law and we practice continually the law of God. The way that we cultivate a walk with the Lord, the way that we have a relationship with Him is by doing what He's taught us to do. We talked about this last week that Jesus in His final instructions to His disciples told them that they should go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then what did He say? Teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. See, how do you walk with the Lord? You do what God has told you to do. You follow in His ways. You walk in His law. We all know what it's like to be a disobedient child. There are rules that our parents set forth for us about how we are to live. And though we might be fairly, fairly obedient, though we might long to please our parents and do what they've asked us to do, in general, there are always things that we decide not to do. In our home growing up, we had a set of rules. There were just certain things that were expected. And there were two rules that I loved to break. I was a pretty obedient child. I tended to do what I was expected to do. It's because I'm a people pleaser and I wanted to please my parents. I didn't really want to get in any trouble. But there were two things I did continually that were disobedient. In our home, we did not wear shoes in the house. And I love to wear my shoes. I love to wear my shoes till I go to bed. So I was continually in trouble for wearing my shoes in the house. And in our house, we did not sit on the countertop. My mother told me once, she told me a thousand times, chairs were made for sitting in, the counter wasn't. And I love nothing more than to hop up on the counter. I still do. See, there are ways that we're supposed to walk in, but there's a part of us, there's that nature of us as being human where we don't walk in obedience 
And of course, you know, because you've all been children and most of you have been parents, you know that when there are rules that cultivate the relationship and set forth the expectation and you break them continually, though there is still love on the part of the parent for the child, there is a brokenness in that relationship. Trust is severed and there, there is an becoming an expectation that you will not do what you're supposed to do. And in fact, the reality is, brothers and sisters, that none of us can perfectly do what we are supposed to do. See, just in the way that we have all broken the law of the Lord, that we've all erred, we all have become in need of someone to keep the law for us. And the first thing that we have to recognize in coming to Psalm 119 and talking about the way of blessing is that there's not one of us who can perfectly keep the law of the Lord. And so how then can we have relationship with the Lord of the law? See, when Psalm 119 begins by talking about the one who, whose way is blameless, who walks in the law of the Lord, the one who keeps the testimonies of God and who seeks him with their whole heart, every one of us should come away going, that's not me. I don't always walk in the way of the Lord. I don't always keep the law of God. My way is not always blameless. So what am I to do? At the heartbeat of Psalm 119 is the recognition that we are all in need of someone to keep the law for us. Because only then, only in having a law keeper, only in having someone whose righteousness is given to us, only in having someone who can restore that relationship that we have broken time and time and time again by failing God, by not walking in His ways, by not keeping His testimonies, by not pursuing obedience to His commands, only by having someone keep that law for us can we then have a relationship with God and can we truly seek Him with our whole heart. And so from the outset, what we have to say, brothers and sisters, is that there is for all of us a perfect law keeper, and his name is Jesus. That Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, came to earth, died a substitute death upon the cross, was laid in a borrowed tomb, and was raised on the third day so that all of the law and the prophets might be fulfilled in him. And every expectation and every command and every instruction that we are called to live out that we cannot perfectly do on our own because we are sinners has been perfectly kept for us by Christ. And so the principle of blessing that comes out of Psalm 119 begins with the understanding that you cannot walk in the way of blessing without first knowing Jesus as your Savior. Everything else hinges upon this reality. You may sit here today and say, listen, I have struggled in my life to walk in the way of the Lord. I have not been obedient to His commands. I don't understand why He is so expecting of things from my life. I don't understand all of His ways. In fact, you might sit here today and say, I disagree with some of the things that God expects of us in our daily life. And I want to implore you to consider today, have you truly trusted in Christ? Is your whole hope in life and in death in the one who died in your place and rose for you that you might have new life in him? Because when we have faith in Jesus Christ, it brings a reorientation of our whole person and the values that we hold dear and the ways that we live our lives are all of a sudden upended so that we are conformed to his image and walk in obedience to him, coming to know Jesus as our Savior, empowered us to walk in his ways and if you say I'm here and I struggle with that and there's no desire in me to do that then I would just simply say you need to ask yourself am I really trusting in Jesus but if we've trusted in Christ then there's an invitation to the way of blessing 
And the principle that the psalmist talks about as he opens for us the Word of the Lord and says this is what it means to walk in the way of the Lord, to walk in the way of blessing. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep His testimonies, who seek Him with their whole heart and also do no wrong, but walk in His ways. What the psalmist is teaching us is that there is a foundational truth upon which we can build our lives, and that is that if we will continually pursue a relationship with the God of the law and continually practice the law of God, we will continually produce the fruit of faith. See, that's what the blessing is. The blessing of God upon your life and the blessing of God upon my life in Jesus Christ as we walk with Him is not the amassing of wealth and it's not the achievement of goals. The blessing of God is the reorientation of our life so that we prioritize the kingdom of God and pursue that in our daily walk. All of a sudden, what God does in us through Christ as we walk with Him and obey Him and seek Him and cultivate relationship with Him on a regular basis as we seek to obey all the commands that He has given us, as we walk in the way of blessing, what God does is, is He grows up in us the fruit of the Spirit. He changes our values so that we seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and trust that everything else will be added to us. What God does is He brings into us the ability to let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. What God does in us when we walk in the way of blessing is that He causes us to set our eyes upon the things of heaven and not upon the things of earth. And as all of that is reoriented in our life, then we come to recognize that all of the resources and all of the stuff that we have is not to amass a kingdom for ourselves. It is to advance the kingdom of Christ. See, the psalmist isn't saying that blessing is never in the form of material good. He's not saying that God would never bless you with financial prosperity. He's not saying that God would never bless you with, with the dreams that you have and maybe of the car or maybe of the home or, or, or maybe of that vacation. He's not saying that God would never bless you with, uh, with, with the kind of stability that you're looking for in life. But he's just saying this, that what God does in blessing His people is not first and foremost about amassing stuff or achieving success. What what God first and foremost does is reorient our lives so that we understand that what matters most is His kingdom and we recognize everything He gives us is to advance that. So I want to ask you this this morning. What is the foundational truth you're building your life on? What are the foundational truths you've taught to your children or your grandchildren? Maybe you've never thought about it before, but I want you to think about it now. If I look back at my life, 30 years, 40 years, 50, 60, 70 years, and I say, what are those things I've been building on? What are those things that are down at the core of who I am? Is it the acknowledgement that, that success looks like achievement in my workplace? Is it that I should be willing to claw my way to the top in order to have financial success? Is it the understanding that nothing's more important than loyalty to my family, not even God? Is there a principle at the bottom of your life that that says my happiness is more important than my holiness? Brothers and sisters, if that's you, and I think at some point that's all of us, the psalmist calls us to recognize that the way of real blessing is to embrace a different principle upon which we build our lives that we would continually pursue the God of the law and continually practice the law of God and know that as we do those things, we will continually produce the fruit of faith. See, the first thing that the psalmist does is give us the principle of blessing, that which is applicable to everybody. 
And then the psalmist calls us in verses 4 through 6 to see the purpose of this blessing. Look at verse 4. He says you. So now he's talking to the Lord, right? He's been talking about everybody generally. He's in third person, but now he switches and he's in second person. And he says you have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. So the recognition, brothers and sisters, is that this way of blessing, that it comes through pursuing the God of the law and practicing the law of God, that this way of blessing is not defined by mankind. It's not defined by the most intelligent among us. It's not defined by the most ingenious among us. It's not defined by the most industrious among us. That the principle upon which we are to build our lives is defined by the one who is outside of us. That God is the one who sets the agenda for the way that you and I are called to live as his people. The psalmist says in verse 4, you have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Do you understand that when the psalmist says you've commanded God, you've commanded your precepts to be kept diligently, that what the psalmist is saying is that these laws of the Lord are not suggestions. He wasn't asking us if this is how we'd like to live. He wasn't merely putting this out there as a, an option for us to undertake. The psalmist says that the one who is outside of us, God himself, sets the agenda for how we are to live. And he says it's not optional, it's a command. You've commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. He says in verse 5, Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. See, what the psalmist is teaching us in verses 4 through 6 is the purpose of blessing. And the purpose of blessing is there clearly stated in verse number 6. It is that we would not be put to shame. One of the interesting things about Psalm 119 is that though we don't know exactly when this psalm was written, it's possible it's written after the time of the exile, or it's possible that it was written before the time of the exile. We don't really know. There's not enough in the psalm to tell us. But one of the things that's interesting about Psalm 119 is the recognition that what the psalmist is doing is he's reflecting upon the law of the Lord. And that that is not something that every individual member of the people of God, of the nation of Israel, would have been able to do, right? You and I have that option. Now, most of us don't avail ourselves of it, or maybe many of us don't avail ourselves of it, but the reality is that every one of us has a Bible in our hands. There's, there's a book at our, at our disposal. We've got a copy of the Word. You may be sitting here today and say, I don't have a copy. That, that copy in the pew is yours. It's our gift to you. So now we're all without excuse. Everybody's got a copy of the book. And every one of us is invited on a daily basis to open the book and to meditate upon the law of the Lord, to consider the deep things of God, to walk in His ways. But the psalmist was writing in a time when not everybody had a copy of the law of the Lord. The Torah was not readily available for everyone to read on a personal daily basis. And so what's happening in Psalm 119 is here is a person who is perhaps a priest or he's perhaps a leader among the people of God. He has his own copy of the Torah and he's reading regularly the law of the Lord and then he's writing down his reflections upon the Word of God. Some of you keep a journal when you do your devotion and you write out the things that God is teaching you. That's what the psalmist is doing in Psalm 119, led by the Holy Spirit, of course, but he's reflecting, he's journaling about what God is teaching him as he reflects upon the law of the Lord. And the psalmist says this, what I've come to know about God's word, what I've been taught in my study of the commandments of God, what the law of God is pushing me to see is that God has commanded these things to be kept diligently. And the reason I pursue them is because I want to be brought into his kingdom and know the fullness of his presence I don't want to be cast into utter darkness and put to shame see brothers and sisters one of the things that Psalm 119 teaches us in terms of 
the purpose of this blessing is that we would know the fullness of relationship with God and not be separated from Him because of our sin. The psalmist says, I want to keep these things diligently. I want to pursue the commands of the Lord. I want the precepts of God to be practiced in my life so that I wouldn't be put to shame. Have we forgotten that there is condemnation coming to the wicked? Have we neglected the reality that those who are far from God will be judged at the last day and cast into outer darkness? Have we presumed upon the grace of God so long that we think that holiness isn't required of us? Understand, brothers and sisters, that, that in the light of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, we would not say that we must perfectly keep the law of God in order to be right with Him because we cannot perfectly keep the law of God. Instead, in Christ, the law of God was perfectly kept for us so that it is His righteousness that is credited to our account by faith. But understand this, that when Christ's righteousness is credited to us by faith in His name, there is an expectation that we will walk in fidelity to Him. that our life will be set upon Him. We used to sing this hymn, Take Time to Be Holy. Speak oft with thy Lord. Abide in Him always. And feast on His Word. Are you taking that time in your life? Is there that, sp that space in your life that is given to Him? Is there something that calls to you early in the morning or late in the evening or at the noon hour that says, I must, I must spend time with God? And I'll do that by turning to His book to hear what He has spoken? And by seeking to implement that in my life? Is there that thing in you, dear one, that says, if I am not right with the Lord, if I do not walk with Him here and now, if I am not pursuing Him on a regular basis, why should I think that I would have life in Him at the last day? See, the psalmist teaches us that the purpose of this blessing, and the blessing is what? The blessing of God upon our life is that when we regularly, continually pursue the God of the law and continually practice the law of God, we will continually produce the fruit of faith. The psalmist teaches that the purpose of that is so that we wouldn't be put to shame. We wouldn't be far from Him, separated from Him, cast aside from Him, condemned by Him. But instead that we would know Him and all the blessing that He can give into our lives. See, there's the principle of blessing and there's the purpose of blessing and then there's the path of blessing. Look at verses 7 and 8. The psalmist says, I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. Now, all of a sudden, it's personal. It was corporate. It's for everybody. The general principle. And it was from the Lord to us. You, O oh Lord, have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. The purpose of which is so that we would not be put to shame. Now, it's personal. The psalmist says, I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. I will keep your statutes. And then notice the last clause. It's a petition, right? It's a prayer. 
He has ascribed praise to the Lord. He's declared how he's going to live. He's in, he's intent upon learning the way of the Lord so that he can keep it and walk in it. And then he offers a petition. He is asking God of something. Do not utterly forsake me. We all know what it's like to say something in a diminished way and to imply in the way that we say it something far more intense, right? Uh, you, you haven't, uh, you know, you haven't had a drink all day. You've been outside working in the law, in, in the yard and, and, and you, and you make a comment about, you know, I, 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 I'm getting kind of parched out here. And what you really mean is, I sure wish somebody bring me a gallon of lemonade, right? You, you know what it's like when you've, when you've been on your hands and knees scrubbing the, the grout in the tile because company's coming and you're trying to get it white and it's, and it's real dingy and you've been in there with a toothbrush and a bottle of Comet all day scrubbing, is this just me? Anyway, scrubbing the, the grout in that tile and you're doing your best to get it pearly white and, and, and everybody else has been watching the ball game and, and you, you say, well boy, I, I wish somebody could help and what you mean is get off of your behind and come in here and scrub this, you know, that's what you mean, right? When the psalmist gets to the end of the psalm after he has underscored the precept and principle of the blessing of God and after he's talked about the purpose of the blessing of God and now he talks about the pathway of the blessing of God and ends with this word of intercession asking a petition of the Lord and he says, do not utterly forsake me. He is minimizing the request but what is at the core of his heart, what is the cry of his soul is God be near to me because I need you and I can't live without you. See, he's come to a hard place in his life. I don't know what it is. I don't know what he's going through. I, I don't know if his body's beginning to fail him. I, I don't know if his mind is weary. I, I don't know if he's worked hard and lost his health. I don't know if his marriage is on the rocks. I don't know if he's become addicted to a substance. What I do know is there's a trouble in his life. There's a valley that he's walking through. He's come to a place of difficulty and he's not sure that he can carry on. And the only thing that the psalmist can do is to remind himself of the way of blessing. That the way of blessing is to continually pursue the God of the law and continually practice the law of God so that he can continually produce the fruit of faith. He's reminded himself of the purpose of blessing and that is so that he would not be put to shame. And then he tells us that there's a path of blessing so that at the end of his day, he wouldn't feel like he's alone. He wouldn't feel like he's down and out. He wouldn't think that he's been forsaken because he would know that God is near to him. And there are some of you in your lives this very day who are so down in your heart so broken in your soul, so perplexed by the trouble in your life, and you're like the psalmist, you're whimpering a quiet prayer, do not utterly forsake me, and the cry of your heart is, God, would you be near to me? If that's you, dear one, With all the authority of the Word, let me give you assurance. He is near to the brokenhearted. He never leaves and He never forsakes His own. So no matter how weary you are, no matter how troubled your soul, no matter how broken your spirit, no matter how ruined your finances. Walk in the path of blessing. This is not the time to abandon. This is not the time to turn away from the Lord. This is not the time to say, listen, I, I've walked with Him all these years and it hadn't done me any good. I'm done. Friend, this is the time to dig your heels in 
and walk in the path. You say, preacher, what's the path of blessing? Well, the psalmist tells us, doesn't he? Look at verse 7. He says there, I will praise you with an upright heart. When I learn your righteous rules, I will keep your statutes. See, the psalmist, he gives you two things. The first thing he says is that the path of blessing, the way you walk in this path, is to praise Him. He says, do you notice this? He says that the praise is tied to your understanding of His ways. I love that. Because you know what? Most of our praise is tied to our circumstances. Did you know that in your life? For most of us, when we come to the Lord's house on the Lord's day, our worship is, it, it is contingent upon how good our life has been. In fact, some of us, some of us will abandon worship when our life gets crummy. But when your life gets crummy, that's the time to dig your heels in. See, the whole point of Psalm 119, 1 through 8, is to teach us that the way of blessing has nothing, nothing, nothing to do with our circumstances and everything to do with the cultivation of a relationship with Holy God on the foundation of faith in His Son. So the psalmist says, I'll praise you, but that the praise flows out of the Word of God. He says, I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. He says, God, the foundation of my worship, the foundation of my adoration, the foundation of my praise, everything I have to give back to you is on the foundation of what you've commanded me, how you've instructed me, how you want me to live, how you've taught me to walk. God, I understand that the more I know about you and the more I I know about your ways, the more that my heart will overflow with worship to you, my great King. So you come here on Sunday and you say, listen, I don't get anything out of that. What are you putting into it? Were you ready to be here today? In your life this week, had you opened the book, learned more about him? Talked with him, walked with him. I'm telling you something, brothers and sisters, that the more we cultivate a life of worship, the more that we will see the fruit of faith in our life. And if we want to cultivate a life of worship, we've got to be in the book. We've got to learn his ways. We've got to understand his precepts. But then notice that the psalmist doesn't just say that this path of blessing is, is centered upon our praise of the Lord. He, he also says it's upon our practice of His ways. He says, I will keep your statutes. I'm going to keep them today, I'm going to keep them tomorrow, and I'm going to keep them in a year, and I'm going to keep them in a decade. I'm going to do what you've told me to do. You, Lord, have the word of life. Your, your principles and commands aren't burdensome. You've given these things so that I would walk in them. So when you get up in the morning and you want to know how am I supposed to live, you come to the book. And, and when you go to work and you get in an argument with your coworker or your boss and you want to know how am I supposed to live, you come to the book. And when you have a falling out with somebody in your family and you want to know how am I supposed to live, you come to the book. And when you find yourself in downfall and don't know how to make ends meet, what do you do? You come to the book. And when all of a sudden you're at war with somebody in the church because you, you can't understand how they're walking and you think they're wrong and they think you're wrong and we're just going to fight and talk about each other, not talk to each other, and you want to know, is that alright? And you come back to the book and he'll teach you it's not alright. So what I'm telling you is that God says through this psalmist that there is a way of blessing. And the way of blessing is that we would continually pursue the God of the law and continually practice the law of God so that we might continually produce the fruit of faith. And the fruit of faith is a reorientation of our life so that we value the things of the kingdom of God and so that we give all of our resources to advance the kingdom of God. He says that we do this so that we might not be put to shame at the last day, but in Instead, so that we would have the closeness of fellowship with God Himself. And He says we do this by praising Him on the foundation of His Word, and we do it by practicing His statutes. 
we do what he's told us to do. So I just want to ask you as we close this morning. How do you view blessing in your life? Is it about achievement? Is it about amassing stuff? Or, or is it about a reorientation of who you are around the kingdom of God? So that everything you are and everything that you have goes to make much of Jesus and to bring people to faith in Him. And if you sit here today and you say, listen, I, I don't know that I've ever really thought much about this before, but, but it's time for a change in my life and I want this to be the foundational truth upon which I build the rest of my life. Then why not just stop where you are today and say to the Lord, Lord, I, I never gave it much thought before. I haven't done this thing right. I've been building on sink and sand, but it's time to build my life on the rock. So through faith in you, I want to pursue you and I want to practice your ways so that the fruit of faith is produced in me. Would you give me the grace? And if you're here today and you say, listen, I know that's what matters most and I've been trying to do that, but, but I've, gotten, I've gotten stalled out somewhere along the way. Well, here's the way. Here's how to, here's how to come back to it. Get in the book and praise Him for what He said and practice what He said. I'm telling you, if you'll do that, it'll change your life. And if we'll do that, it'll change the church. And if all the churches of the Lord Jesus Christ would do that, it would change the world. Because all of the fruit of faith would start blossoming in the world. And people would be changed by it.